So we are here at the 84th Cold Spring Harbor Symposium on Quantitative Biology. This year it's focusing on RNA control and regulation. My name is Anke Sparman. I'm a senior editor at Nature Structural and Molecular Biology. I'm very happy to be joined today with, by Dr. Maria Elena Torres Padilla. Thanks for making the Thank time. Thank you, Anke. Uh, Maria Elena is the director of the Institute of Epigenetic and, and Stem Cells at the Helmholtz Center in Munich. Mm -hmm. Her research focused on, focuses on transitions of cellular potency and cell fate decisions, and she's working with totipotent cells at the very early stages of mammalian um, development, shortly after fertilization. So before we go too much into the, the research that you're doing, maybe you can start by saying why, what fascinated you about the cellular system, and because it's also very difficult to work <laughs> with. Yep. Yeah, indeed. Um, okay, as you mentioned, we are interested in understanding how these very early cells uh, of the really very early embryo are actually able to establish and maintain the largest plasticity that one can think of. And in a sense, uh, you know, when I go to the students and I say, "Ah, oh, you know, this is exciting. It's the embryo," because I, you know, thought what embryo. You know, people might think that this is boring, but. Um, I think it's quite remarkable if I tell the students that you know, everybody in the room at some point was a single cell. And so the, really the question is how that single cell is able to generate a new being. Mm -hmm. but not, not, not only <coughs> all the tissues and cells that we have in our body, but really how that single cell builds up the whole program that we call uh, totipotency. And indeed, as you say, the system is um, difficult, and it's difficult in the sense that we have very limited material. So we use, um, as a model, the mouse. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we don't do these um, things with uh, ethically compromised um, uh, experiments with humans, for example. Oh, yeah, but we do use the uh, mouse and also other species as a model to understand these transitions. But you don't get a lot of embryos to try really, for example, to understand biochemically what happens with mm -hmm. these embryos and so on. So I could say that um, so the system is really fascinating. But but um, it is a challenge. And so what, what are you seeing in these very early stages compared to then when differentiation occurs? So probably what I could say, there's been quite a lot of surprises or uh, things that we did not anticipate when we started to ask, how is this um, RNA regulation and chromatin architecture um, taking place in these early embryos? And I could say that every single hypothesis that we put out there was basically wrong. I mean, we had a lot of <laughs> unexpected findings and probably I would say one, which is actually also relevant for the topic of the, of the symposium, which is that um, the retrotransposons, which is um, actually uh, um, occupying typically a, a very large proportion of our genome, are heavily transcribed. So um, these transposons, and as I said, it's in our genomes and the mouse, it's something ar around 50% of the genome. So it's not the normal coding gene, like, you know, like the um, protein of the skin or of the liver is really mm -hmm. like like repeats that are in our genome that are half percent of half, um, half of our genome. Um, so these um, uh, transposons are typically known to be silenced mm -hmm. in all your somatic cells or your liver, your and, and so on. And um, it has been thought that um, it is important to keep them silent because otherwise they can actually jump. So mm -hmm. evolutionary speaking, they can jump, and people have thought that they can um, originate mutations. And I could say that um, a surprise has come in the recent years, and, and this is actually what was, that was pioneered by Barbara Knowles many years ago. But um, in the course of the last decade, um, we have found that there's a large fraction of these transposons that are heavily transcribed. And um, of course, this has potential of regulation at the chromatin level, which we are particularly interested in, but also at the RNA level, right? What is the RNA that is um, coded by these transposons that often, or let's say not always, uh, have um, an ore for a, a protein produced. Mm -hmm. um, what is actually this RNA able to do, if at all? And is it not causing a lot of problems for the cell? It's so much of transcription is going on in terms of, you know, just the sheer cost of transcribing all these regions and having them there. So um, I, I think that you know you could have asked me the same question five years ago or seven years ago. I would have, I would have said, yeah. I mean, why are we spending so much energy, or the cell is spending so much energy on transcribing that much? Um, but I guess that you know the question has been, 
whether this transcription is actually functional, right? If mm -hmm. it, is this just a side effect and a waste of energy, or is this really meaningful for the developmental process and for totipotency establishment? And I would say that there again we have actually found quite a few uh, surprises. So, um, for example, the line elements, which are very abundant, 20% um, mm -hmm. of the genome roughly, we've um, observed recently that uh, they seem to be actually involved in opening up the chromatin structure of the embryo. So I guess that to come back to your question, is this not a waste of energy? Um, I could say that rather than a waste of energy, it actually has become part of the developmental program. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is where it becomes interesting, right? How is it possible that these repeats and these remnants of viral infections that we have in the genome have been co-opted to <laughs> regulate such a regulated process in, in development? Yeah, and also such an important part or step in development as well. Exactly, it, yeah. because if, if you don't make it there, then the species is basically gone, <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 So, in terms of the genome being much more open than in a differentiated cell, mm -hmm. does that also have then, is that what's causing this transcription or has it also other um, effects? I think this is a good question. So, the, I, I think that probably one of um, the items that we have to invest quite a lot in understanding this transposon function in the genome is what is cause and what is consequence or, mm -hmm. or what is just just a correlation. And again, there I could say there's a few cases where I think we can really put our finger and say this is actually causative. Mm -hmm. um, again, for the, the, the case of Lyme, what um, we did uh, is actually to try to manipulate them directly by targeting transcription factors to them and, and trying to manipulate their transcription. Yeah. Um, so in terms of whether that's a cause and consequence, I think at least for a subfamilies, a small portion of these transposons, I think we can probably say that at least their, trans their transcription is causing changes on the chromatin architecture. Um, now, whether this is because the genome is just being open and is being transcribed, I think we still have quite a lot of work to do there. And you know, try to also figure out what is the uh, specific regulation of all of them, if at all, right? This is just open or um, because actually at the same time, it's not that all the genome is, is activated, right? Yeah. So there is certain specificity that I think we don't really understand very well yet. Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I want to go back also to a, a recent paper that you published looking at the genome organization. Ah. That's. Um, that was also yeah. very interesting because it also shows um, some of the dynamics that are going on at that stage of mm -hmm. differentiation. Yeah, so um, yeah, this actually just came out today. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, very, I think, last, last week. Yeah, so indeed, we also have been interested in um, understanding how the nucleus first becomes what we call regionalized. And I think, so for many years, we've known based on um, early studies by, by many other colleagues that um, the genes that tend to be in the internal part of the nucleus are, um, in a somatic cell uh, could be more prone for activation, so the transcriptional activity is higher. Mm -hmm. Whereas the genes that would be a little bit more on the periphery of the nucleus, they tend to be silenced. And I guess that uh, the question that uh, was also important is when is this regionalization that is functional perhaps is first established? And I think that stems from um, observations, uh, again, you know, based on all these heterochromatic regions, um, that heterochromatin is positioned within the nucleus of the embryo in a very weird manner. So it doesn't really have this typical clustering that you mm -hmm. see in the somatic cells, and instead it forms sort of um, rings around the nucleolar precursors. Um, so mm. the question has been whether this atypical uh, organization, nuclear organization, is actually important for development as well. And um, what we um, uh, try to do, and now actually I have to say that with the development of the new um, low input protocols for looking at yeah. the genomic um, changes in the embryo, this, this really has made a, a change in, in, in the field. And so we team up with uh, Job Kin, who had actually set up the DAM-ID uh, technique to basically generate molecular mapping of the genome um, in single cells. Uh, so he did that while he was um, a postdoc, and um, now he has his uh, own group in the Hubrick Institute. And so what we managed to do is to actually map the regions of the genome that become organized um, in this uh, nuclear periphery, so in mm -hmm. proximity with nuclear lamina, versus those that would be um, in internally. So what we call the lamina-associated domains, or LATs, versus mm -hmm. the 
in the lands of the internal regions. Mm -hmm. And there again, I think there's actually quite a lot of, of surprises. And um, one um, thing that we found is that um, these um, lamin associated domains are established very early. A few hours after fertilization, the nucleus is actually already um, compartmentalized, if you could put it that way. So there's a very clear um, lab formation early on. Mm -hmm. and, um, and there again, I guess that if I want to be very deterministic, I would say that um, actually something around 20% um, of our genome, if we extrapolate widely to, to the human, uh, mm -hmm. but at least in the mouse, 20% of the genome becomes localized in these labs three or four hours after fertilization, and it remains so for the rest of the life. So these are actually what um, regions of the genome that are constantly at the periphery. So in a sense, that also would tell you that this very first cell is already having um, kind of a skeleton in or scaffolding mm -hmm. how the genome is going to be organized. Um, at the same time, what we also found is that if you look at the um, autosomes, so at, at, at the, uh, our chromosomes, um, again in the mouse, um, we did not detect association with the lamina in the oocyte. So that is in the oh. maternal germline before yeah. fertilization. And I think that has quite a number of implications. Um, the first one is that um, that obviously indicates that nuclear organization is established de novo after mm -hmm. fertilization and it's not inherited. Um, and obviously yeah. that also gives us the opportunity to try to understand how is this nuclear organization established mechanistically speaking. Yeah, yeah because that would be very interesting to see Especially, like you're saying, that there are certain proportions that then is always, you know, from at the, the early yeah. point at the membrane, like how is that part of the genome then partitioned away? Yeah, um, and I, I, I have to say that again, this was unexpected because um, almost a year ago, we had done some experiments where we had tethered heterochromatin from the internal um, part of the nucleus to the periphery. Mm -hmm. and. Um, so we did those experiments trying to understand again why the nuclear organization was important for, for, for heterochromatin formation or, or, or gene function. And actually what we observed is that when we do those experiments, um, heterochromatin becomes de-repressed. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're basically we're, we were bringing um, pericentromer heterochromatin to the periphery and instead of having it more silence, yeah. like one would expect from what we know from somatic cells, there would be a de-repression. Um, ah, so that's actually a little bit again to say, well, you know, I think um, the embryo does seem to have a little bit of a different um, epigenetic landscape, let's call yeah. it like this, from a very general perspective. And that seems to be, um, you know, both from the activation of transposons that we were discussing mm -hmm. before, but also the nuclear organization. And um, I guess that, you know, the list will become a little longer in the next year. <laughs> yes. But that is also interesting to see that these cells really are then very distinct and they challenge also how we think about, you know, heterochromatin silent located there. And it's not always like that. No, but I, 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 you know, this is, I think, the importance of um, also approaching the question with a, what I call the very open-minded, right? You just launch a hypothesis and then you have to be quite open to see what kind of um, uh, findings you're going to have, right? Because they might be completely different to what you're um, used to or what you would expect, which I think is the cool thing about the biology yeah, that we're studying. That's true. So, but you were talking about the, the female uh, genome. Uh -huh. How about the male or the paternal yeah. genome? So, um, formally, we cannot do this kind of experiments of damage with the lamin in the sperm, mm -hmm. because there is not really a proper laminar uh, organization mm -hmm. in, the, in the sperm. Um, so, and, and you know, as you know, also the fertilization also implies that um, um, the, the DNA goes basically almost naked, well, with proteins yeah, into, yeah, into the oocyte. True. And so therefore, the, the, it's not really very clear that process of fertilization, what really happens in terms of, you know, how is the nuclear envelope formed and how, what are the components? And uh, there's a couple of papers, and, but I could say that that's a process that we don't know enough of. Mm -hmm. uh, regardless, I could say that, um, because there is not really like a proper um, nuclear organized, let's say nuclear um, lamina in the sperm, we probably 
would anticipate that that organization is also set up the novel. Yeah. But of course, formally, we cannot rule out that there's some organization in the spam or some information that comes and that basically would, would drive um, that the novel formation uh, of LATS. Um, now, what we do see is that after fertilization, um, so where we have the two pernuclei still separated, mm -hmm. the LATS are formed in both pernuclei, not okay. only on the female, but both. Um, so they're slightly different in terms mm -hmm. of um, genomic features in the paternal and the maternal um, pernuclea, but pretty much 20% of the genome goes to the, to the, to the periphery. Um, and so that's again interesting because it also um, um, implies that um, the, the two parental genomes are actually slightly different in terms of nuclear organization. But what we found is that these uh, differences are actually resolved by the time the embryo actually gets to implantation. Well, it sounds like there are many more interesting questions to address in that. So thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you, Anke.